I had put this episode on the back burner, and I never intended on recording it, much less releasing it. Then last night, there was a terrorist attack in Paris. If ever there was a time for heroes, I know there's a whole bunch of people who could use one right now. I don't know if I can be a hero. I was to someone once. Maybe I can be again. I can't do anything amazing. I can't change the world. I'm not really anybody special. If anything, I'm more broken and screwed up than most. My wife once told me, it doesn't matter what you say. What matters is what your audience hears. I thought I understood what she meant, but I didn't until today. Not really. When we communicate, whenever we say, do, or commit any form of communication, we create something. We send it out into the world. With luck, someone receives that thing. We are responsible for that thing. Right now, there are eight dead men in Paris who sent out a message. The message they wanted to send out was fear and pain. After sending out that message, they killed themselves because they were cowards and didn't have the conviction to face the consequences of their message. They created a powerful message and they let it go run wild amok across the world. I sit here with my laptop and I ask myself, what can I do against such hate? How can I fight something so inhuman and cruel? I feel helpless, like last time. As I watch the events unfold on television, as I watch the body count creep higher, as I watched, I realized I could do something. I am a storyteller. They told their story, and now I will tell another. I will give you a message. I have created it specifically to protect you. I will send it into the world, and while few will hear it, I know that I am not the only teller of stories. Others will tell stories as well, and when enough stories have been told, I will stand at the edge, I will stare into the abyss, the abyss will blink first. I will howl into the darkness. Hopefully, my story will lead someone back into the light. So, I'm dead. It was bound to happen sooner or later. I'm not entirely certain how it happened. I like the idea I went down swinging my resignation letter while I was locked in mortal contract negotiations. But I suspect it was something far more mundane. Death is usually boring. That's the problem with modern media today. We over-dramatize death. We give it a front row status. There is only so much bandwidth in the world that a person can absorb, and as of late, it has been consumed with death. Real death is usually a pointless accident, or a senseless murder, or somebody just finally gave out, and they just stopped living. No, I suspect if you're listening to this, it's because of some senseless and pointless death. But only because all death is senseless, and I doubt I was one of those rare individuals who figured out how to die with a point. Albert Camus once said that the only true philosophical problem is one of suicide. In the end, ultimately, everything we do is meaningless. So if it doesn't matter if you die now or in a hundred years, why put it off? He was a victim of his time, in my opinion. He missed the original flaw in his logic. The belief that just because everything is temporary, it doesn't matter. To follow his logic, if nothing matters, then everything is of equal value. Therefore, every choice you make is the most important choice in the world. It just happens to be tied for first place. Now, some would argue that some choices are more important than others. The choices of the president might be just a little more important than yours. If you agree with this, like I do, then you are stating that choices do have some value. If choices have value, then life has value, and the world isn't meaningless. The problem is accepting the disconnect between meaning and temporary. Camus called this cognitive dissidence the absurd. Life is absurd if you look at it close enough. The universe is inherently a place of chaos. Life seeks to subvert that chaos and create order and patterns in the chaos. Because of this, we have a desire for understanding, 
in a world that is built on something that by the very definition of what it is cannot be understood. In a way, life is absurd. It's this absurdity that causes people to lose hope and give in and simply wish to die. We can endure almost any amount of pain if we believe there is a good enough reason. The universe has no permanent reasons, fundamentally. So you are left with two choices, denial or acceptance. Denial comes in three flavors. First is ignorance. You simply choose to ignore the absurdity. Everything is fine, don't think about it. Just keep your head down and move on. The second is anger. You decide that you will rage against the absurdity and try to impose your order on it. The third is bargaining. You try to make a deal with the absurdity. You create a narrative. You make a sacrifice. You try to work it out. And as soon as you work it out, everything will be fine. In the end, these are all just denial. The absurd is what the absurd is. If we could change it, then we could change it to begin with, and there'd be no point in getting angry or trying to make a deal. In case you're trying to understand what I'm saying and it's not coming through clearly, basically it comes down to the five stages of grief. Life is absurd. Death is absurd. Dealing with what we cannot change is part of life. We struggle against everything because that's the point. It's all temporary, but temporary things can have meaning. I like to think I had a meaning. Maybe I didn't. Doesn't matter. I know that I was, and so while on the grand scale of the universe I was next to nothing, I was still more than nothing. You are more than nothing. Accept this and move on. Stop getting caught up in the absurd pursuit of determining the value of your life against other values that are also next to nothing. We are all temporary things living in a temporary thing that means something and may someday no longer mean what it did. My meaning is over. Your meaning continues. Maybe I meant nothing to you. However, you all meant something to me. Every person who hears my voice, every life I have touched, every drop of rain that has landed on me instead of landing on the dry, parched earth. I had an influence that extends out into the eons that I will never understand, nor do I need to. You don't need to know either. You are, you live, you exist, you have meaning. Do not waste your time on me. Move past the stages of depression and denial and move on to acceptance. There are things we cannot change and things that we can. Focus on what you control, relax about what you cannot. Enjoy this state of temporary meaning for as long as it lasts. Then try and enjoy it just a little bit more. Welcome once again to another installment the klaxon begin to wail. I am not a number. I am a free man. The klaxon begin to wail. I am not a number. I am not a number. I am your host, Robert York. I am a free man. Taking you through the midnight hour to the early morning. Taking you midnight hour to the early morning, taking you through the midnight hour to the early morning. My fellow Americans, I'm pleased to tell you today that I've signed legislation. We begin bombing in five minutes. As you listen to the klaxon begin to wail. We begin bombing in five minutes. As you listen to the radio station. Whoops! Who put that in the queue? Sorry about that, folks. Uh, any reports of my death is greatly exaggerated. True, an albino wearing uh, a white jogging suit was found dead just outside the radio station. Cause yet unknown, but that was not me. Please disregard any rumors of my death. 
Oddly enough, I was going to jog to work today like I usually do, but all this strange weather made me nervous about getting caught in the rain, so I figured I'd drive today. It's just been weird lately, huh? I mean, take what just happened before the show. I caught Phil walking out of the ladies' restroom. Can you believe it? I confronted him about it, and you know what I found out? It turns out he is a she. Yeah, I know. I, I guess I should have thought something was up in retrospect. Considering the dresses she wore, the jewelry, the makeup, her high heel shoes, her strawberry hair done up in a short bouffant, the lack of facial hair, the fact that everything she owns is in pink, including her car, which is covered in My Little Pony Friendship is Magic decals, the Betty Boop bobblehead on her dashboard, the Girl Power bumper sticker spelled G-R-R-R-L Power, the Hello Kitty brand name cell phone, the way she dots her eyes with tiny little hearts, the butterfly stickers all over her workspace, and the fact that she wore a bra. However, in my defense, I would like to point out that she introduced herself as Phil, which is clearly a man's name. Apparently it's short for Philotes. She should have called herself Philly, except that would have made her a horse. Or a brand of cream cheese. You know what? <laughs> Maybe we'll just stick with Intern Phil. Huh? Oh, right. Sorry. Back to the show. We're going to be starting off our show with an announcement from the Night Vale Department of Meteorological Studies. The announcement is, what? We're supposed to be studying weather. I thought we were supposed to be looking for meteors. Holy hopping Huntokar. Suddenly all the news feeds from all these weather stations make a lot more sense. We're terribly sorry about dropping the ball. Our bad. Oh. FYI, there is apparently some huge hurricane forming somewhere, and it looks like all these swirling thingies are coming towards us. Or something. Or maybe it's some sort of sim game. We're not sure. Then they followed up with, hey, get off our back. It's not like any of you ever called us about anything before. Basically, this is our first day on the job. We'll get back to you when we figure out what these thingies around the office do. He concluded by muttering under his breath some sort of unkind comment towards the reporters in attendance, then itched his nose with only his middle finger before departing in a huff. And now, a word from our sponsors. Nightmare Toilet Hole! Nightmare Toilet Hole! Nightmare Toilet Hole! Are you tired of people dying on your toilet and having to deal with the embarrassment of a coroner having to walk the body out past your guests? Do you need some way to discourage people from using your toilet? Or even better, a way to motivate your children to do as they are told? Then you need the Nightmare Toilet Hole. We come into your home and install a hole directly in front of your toilet with a trap door. The trap door comes with a remote with two settings. The disposal setting is perfect for when you have a dead body on your toilet just press the button and watch the dead body slide away into a discreet containment area. The second setting is great for a practical joke as it causes a low growl to emit from the nightmare toilet hole before causing mist to leak out from the crack right before it slowly begins to open and a horrible evil light seeps out. If your guest hasn't had a bowel movement, he will now. And if you have children who wet the bed, you can show them the, quote, monster, unquote, and tell them that the monster is fed by using the toilet. If the monster isn't given food on a consistent basis, it will come out of its hole. And find food, 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 food. Let me assure you, my children use our bathroom with the regularity of a German train schedule. And if you act now on our special offer, we will throw in absolutely free the Deluxe Sweeney Todd Edition, a must for all recycling enthusiasts. The Deluxe Sweeney Todd Edition is the only nightmare toilet hole to get the seal of approval from the Red Cross. Supplies are limited, so order now. Nightmare Toilet Hole This has been a word from our sponsors. And now, letters from the listeners. A listener left a message on the voicemail that was transcribed to be read by me as follows. Dear France, I'm afraid the events of last night 
are just unfolding as I record this. Those of us who experienced other horrific events by people so consumed with fanatical belief that they can only experience hatred in their hearts. We spent the night tied to the television, watching every grisly detail unfold. The death toll is still unknown. The true depths of the pain that you experience will never be known. Night Vale is a fictional place where we experience pain and horrific loss on a regular basis, but that is to highlight the absurdity of it all. In the end, it's just a story that shows that horror exists. If we laugh at those horrors, the pain becomes less. Trust me, there will come a point where you will need to laugh at this horror. I know I had to in order to move on. I know right now it doesn't look like you'll ever laugh again. I know that right now you don't think you'll ever get over this. I just want to let you know, having experienced the loss of loved ones, that there is one important thing you need to know. You won't get over this. Don't try to get over it. Getting over it is what you do when you want to forget something. When you want to put something away in a box and pretend it never existed. Don't even try. I tried. I failed. You will never get over it. You can get through it. You can get past it. That is the method that one must use to handle any true horror. From the most extreme loss of life at the hands of those who are consumed with the worship of death, to the most petty of pains suffered at the hands of those who simply are ignorant of the injury they inflict with their casual cruelty. You have to accept your pain for what it is, if you ever hope to heal from it. You can get past pain, but only if you deal with it, not avoid it. Life is suffering. Life is also joy. You are experiencing more than the loss of life and loved ones, but of innocence and illusion. We can do what we can to protect ourselves as much as possible, but in the face of madness it is impossible to truly be safe. Only by becoming as insane as your enemies can you hope to protect yourself perfectly. However, that is the path to becoming your enemies. Once you do that, there is no turning back. I have no kind words other than you will endure. You will mourn. You will clench your fists. You will ask, what can I do? You will feel helpless. The anger will grow. That is when your resolve will become firm and you will make your choice. It might not seem like it right now. But you will become stronger for this. You will be better. You will improve. You may fall victim again or you may never be tricked again. It doesn't matter. Don't fall prey to looking for meaning in madness. There is no meaning. There is no point. There is no higher purpose. You aren't being punished by God or fate or karma. You didn't have this coming. This was an act by cowards, and they want nothing more than to die while taking as many people with them as possible. They don't want to live, and unfortunately, they are so consumed with a hatred for life, your love of life actually causes them pain. They have embraced an imaginary friend and were told that if they die in this manner, their imaginary friend will reward them in death. They've been told there was glory and honor in acts that can never have either. I don't know if there is a supernatural world or an afterlife or anything after this one. I do know that the specific imaginary friend that they worship isn't real, nor is it worshipped by any other sane human on the planet. You have someone to blame. That someone is Isis. Isis isn't everyone with a turban and a beard. The cult is the problem, not everyone who looks like them. The need to lash out in blind rage will be almost overwhelming. I know. I was there myself, more times than I can count. 
Now is not the time for blind vengeance. Now is the time to heal the wounded, deal with your pain, then make a very cold, calculated response to destroy the cult. It won't have the same visceral joy as dropping a nuke on them, but a cult is an idea. An idea is much harder to kill than the people who are infected with it. Night Vale may be fictional, but it has a lesson, like all fiction has. Life endures. Hope survives. When the pain comes, feel it. Let it hurt. Do not ignore it. Do not push it aside and say, I've got work to do. Don't bury it. Don't hide from it. Don't get over it. If you're going to heal, you have to feel. You need to get through this in order to get past it. If you need to take a moment to gather your strength, then do so. If you need to put it aside in order to complete work that must be done, do it. Just don't fall into the trap bottling it up and forgetting about it. It's easy to simply push past something and never look back, hoping that if you do nothing but focus on the current task at hand, you can forever put off having to deal with the pain. All that does is leave you with a wound that will never heal. I hope my words can give you some solace in your time of need. All I can say with certainty is that I understand. Not that I know your pain, I simply can relate. With time, it will get better. There is always something horrible about to happen. Don't let that stop you from living. With most heartfelt condolences for your loss. Night Vale This has been Letters from the Listeners. And now, traffic. Wait here, I'll be right back. I regretted my phrasing immediately since I knew she was not one who tolerated commands, but I was already committed to my course of action. I let down my luggage carelessly, and before it had landed I had run halfway to my room. I was followed by a light thump as they fell over, inadvertently and unintentionally, making it difficult for someone to pursue me. I swung myself into the darkness of my soon-to-just-be-a-memory room, crouched in front of my desk, then reached into the inky void that was my bookshelf. It would have been helpful to flick the lights on for just a second to get a snapshot of what was in front of me, but annoyance was radiating from down the hall, and I had a feeling I was pushing her very close to her limits. I ran my fingers over pages and covers, feeling for the right texture, the right thickness, the right familiarity. Given the right amount of familiarity, fingers can be good eyes in the dark. In this case, my hands had spent more than enough time with every single item on this shelf. A few seconds of shuffling and three annoyed huffs from the hallway later, my fingers stopped on the glassy cover that I had sent them hunting for. Smiling, I reached deep before I pulled the book out and laid it on the desk in a single, smooth motion. It's important to do these things in the right order. To get this part right, I needed light because fingers, as good as they are at picking up on shapes, can't pick up colors. Mine couldn't anyways. Not at that particular moment, at least. Now I know there are more talented fingers out there that can pick up colors, smells, thoughts, and confused feelings, but mine were far dumber than that. Light was not an option for reasons already stated, so I had to rely on my least reliable sense, my memory. Most people don't realize memory is a sense. They think of it as an event, or as a process, or even as a curse in certain circles. They are quite wrong. Memory is a sense as useful as any of the others. Some people I know can remember things before they happen, and have the good sense enough to do something about it. Alas, while I find a reliable memory can be useful, it is also painful, so it is something I try to control, not cultivate. Fiercely frowning, as if that would help steer my memory to the right place, I flipped through pages and stopped at the one that had a faint bluish glow in the dark that made my memory a little less uncertain than it had felt. I grabbed hold of the blue page and ripped it off in a quick but unfortunately loud move. At this point, I could sense the ripples of disapproval rolling in and flooding the room, so I held my breath and stepped out quickly. Most of the time, pretending like nothing had happened doesn't make the thing that happened go away. But it can confuse witnesses long enough to give you a window of opportunity. Usually I use said opportunity to avoid immediate consequences, and that's just what I tried to do. 
I scooped up my luggage, stepped past her burning glare, and quipped, shall we go then? It didn't work. She didn't say anything, which was bad. The only thing that followed me was a vengeful stare, which was worse. I didn't know how I could tell she was doing any of this without looking at her, but I knew all too well that she was, which was probably the worst. Or rather, I didn't know that I knew by knowing it, but as I said before, it is usually something I try to avoid. Yet another in another long list of unfortunate choices. Trying to paddle myself out of the brewing storm on the quickly disintegrating raft of pretense I had built earlier, I stepped out of the main door without hesitation, and in doing so I quickly regretted not taking the time to take one last look at the house. Pride and a small tinge of fear held me back from turning around and saying goodbye to the small space that was my home. A bubble of cozy, interconnected, and rectangular rooms confined by short concrete walls and glass windows. My very human nest. It was behind me, and I couldn't turn to say goodbye. Too many metaphors at the same time can have that effect on you. One should say goodbye, especially when you know this to be your last opportunity to converse with a subject. You might not think that one should say goodbye to a place, and normally one would not. However, this place was a place of memories, and when they are interconnected in a fashion to become a home, it is best to say goodbye. It gives you a sense of closure, a bookend to place around your thoughts. Otherwise, your judgment might get muddled. How often have you found yourself thinking about events at places beckoned by a smell, or a sound, or a trick of light? Such unwanted intrusions can be avoided with a simple farewell. Standing there, under the light of stars and foggy moons, with thoughts of home and smells of earthly night running through my head, a new wave of emotion was building inside, which I knew, if not restrained, would stop me from taking another step. So it was fortunate that the Red Lady stepped out around the same time. She was still holding her vindictive, I can't believe you just did that stare. She didn't say anything, paused for a moment next to me, then walked away in long, swift steps. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to follow this strange woman into the unfamiliar world she was leading me to, but she had an invisible cord connecting me to her that pulled me unwillingly or perhaps absent-mindedly after her. For all I knew, I was still there, standing on the porch, my feet on the welcome rug. To be honest with all of you, in a way, I still am. I caught up with her seconds later, feeling a small but quickly growing knot in my chest. She must have sensed it because she tried to distract me. What did you go back for? She demanded to know. It wasn't that she cared for what I had gone back for or for my feelings. She just didn't want to have them surface while I was in her presence. A preemptive strike on her part. A map, I replied. A map? Of what? A world map. The next sound could only be described as a snort, although I'd be hard pressed to tell you from where it originated. Where did you get it from? She asked with a slight hint of surprise in her voice. My geography textbook. What part of the world does it map out? Just Earth. She rolled her eyes, except she didn't exactly do the human gesture that is the rolling of eyes. Instead, her ears flicked forward and her nose wrinkled, but somehow, slightly unsettled, I realized I knew what the expression meant. So that's what you call the world, she shook her head. There's a universe of immeasurable space, and that's what you call it. Dirt. It's the only world I care for. She turned to me without stopping and studied my face with curiosity and disappointment. I diverted my eyes quickly and pinned them to the ground. I was angry. I was scared. I was standing on the line in defense of my world. No wonder, she replied coldly. She started to walk faster. I didn't match her pace, letting the gap between us grow larger.
This has been Traffic. Listeners, the Night Vale Department of Meteorological Studies has just issued an urgent warning that reads as follows. Seriously? We just press this button and it sends out a message to all media outlets? Oh, that is so cool. Uh, hi mom. What? Oh, right. We've been looking at our highly scientific weather monitoring equipment, including the thing with the sweeping beam, the spinny pointy things, and the device that goes ping. We have detected a low pressure system that is moving towards Night Vale at a great rate of speed, and it will hit the town in less than an hour. What makes this hurricane so amazing is that it is full, and by full, I mean jammed packed with, get this, angels. I'm serious, it's full of actual angels. I'm going to be famous. Hey, I get to name it, right? Ooh, how about an angelicane? I like that. Rolls off the tongue. Angelicane. Say it with me. Angelicane. Anyway, the angels are swelling around and, hey, what are you people doing in here? What do you mean angels aren't real? We have a clear reading on this device, right? Holy glow cloud. Why are you shooting the device that goes ping? Do you have any idea? Wham. Ow. Wham. Ow. Wham. Stop it. Wham. Okay. Okay. I'll say anything you want. Just stop hitting my head against the... And that's where it ends. Oh, wait. Another emergency message just came over the wire. Sorry about that. Disregard the previous message. We were wrong. Everything is fine. Go about your day. Or night in this case. Well, I guess that means we have nothing to worry about. And now it's time for Listen and Learn with Mr. Science. This Listen and Learn has been sponsored by a vague yet threatening government agency in conjunction with the Night Vale chapter of the NRA. Let's tune in and listen live as Mr. Science once and for all, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that guns do not kill people. This has been Listen and Learn with Mr. Science. Listeners, things are totally out of hand, or rather, not out of hand. I am totally not allowed to tell you about a giant, white, glowing whirlwind that might be lashing our town to pieces. I would be completely out of line to tell you that an angelicane is raging all around us, and it is only a matter of time before this non-existent, incredibly destructive force doesn't wipe us out. Nothing to worry about. Everything is fine. A hurricane filled with angry angels is not raining holy hellfire down upon us. We are not the subject of divine fury. However, I can point out that tonight is the first time ever they fired up the new Night Vale hockey rink. They're testing some of the facility and, as you may remember, it is kept cold by the use of channeling old spoiled liquid hydrogen straight from the Pulsar facility. Which reminds me, if anybody starts experiencing time periodically rewinding itself for no apparent reason, uh, it is highly recommended that you do the exact same actions as before, or you might accidentally create two of yourself. If that does happen, just remember that one of you has to die. Or, you will both go slower and slower, or, from the point of view of the universe, you will go faster and faster, until you view everything as either going infinitely fast, or you've become frozen in time. At which point, you will explode in a burst of microwave radiation, which, oddly enough, is what they are using to keep the nachos warm in the concession booths around the hockey rink. I mean, who likes cold nachos? I'm sure you're right, seriously? But I digress. The events of this evening seem to be finally drawing to a close. The window from my broadcast booth has an excellent view of the empty expanse across the ravine, which always struck me as a little strange because my broadcast booth is located in a disused bathroom in the steam tunnels. Regardless, there appears to be a gathering in the expanse. Normally it would be difficult to make out, except the glowing lights of something non-existent is making the night as bright as day. It's easy to see the many, many, many figures wearing official government suits with collars turned up against the unpredictable gusts of wind and sheets of rain. There appear to be two factions, ones dressed in gray 
and ones dressed in black. These are clearly agents from both the vague yet threatening and vague yet menacing government agencies that have been having their clandestine interdepartmental rivalry here in Night Vale. This appears to have all the makings of a final showdown. They have gathered here just as nothing gathers overhead. They have gathered with suitcase nukes and strange, shivering, metallic devices that are not of this world. Cover is being taken. Glowing shields are being erected. They have guns. Oh, so many guns. Vehicles are arriving. Vehicles bristling with strange projections and antennae and discs and what I can only describe as large bore projectile weaponry. Overhead, the sky is filling up with disc-shaped crafts and silently hovering black helicopters. Above them, the void is gone, replaced with a swirling of building energies filled with darting figures that couldn't possibly be angels. I believe I have read about this in future history class. This must be that first incident, the incident that started the Blood Space War. I never thought that I would live to witness this. Here I am, at the start of an era of endless horror, and all I can do is stand here. Actually, all I can do is stand here. I, I seem to be frozen in place. I am unable to move. I am unable to turn away. My body is no longer following my commands. I am compelled to witness. I am compelled to chronicle these events. Well, that is my job. I would be lying if I stated I was comfortable here. Still, I have no choice but to watch. Oh. In my reflection in the window, I can see something behind me. It is the red light of a laser. It is playing along the wall behind me as if searching. It is searching for a target. I fear that target is me. I can see why those gathered in the Expanse would want to silence any witnesses, and unfortunately I have been broadcasting my position all night, so in retrospect, I did bring this on myself. My sudden incapacitation could not have come at a worse time. My heart has leaped into my throat. The light is moving closer, closer, and... No, no, I shall not go out like this. I am a reporter. A reporter reports he doesn't lament his own misfortune. So, for as long as I can, I shall report. In the expanse, the gathered are still. All are silent. Eerily silent. There seems to be... No. No, I think they're just waiting. For... Some sort of signal. An, an order? A gesture? The right moment when all hell shall be released by something unspeakable? Just as something unspeakable swirls on high. The red dot is on my chest now. I can see it in my reflection in the window. It is moving higher. There seems to be some sort of activity. There is movement on one edge. A figure is moving towards the center. The light has moved to my forehead. It is slowly bobbing about. I... <clears throat> the figure moves to the crowd. The crowd parts for him. The figure... The figure... The figure is dressed in a suit like all the others, but his suit, his suit is all white. It's hard to make out the details with the laser dot occasionally moving over my eyes and temporarily blinding me. I fear this evening's broadcast is about to be cut short, so... I do apologize for any inconvenience this may cause you, dear listener. I'd ask somebody to set up a pre-recorded message, but everyone else has taken shelter from where... Well, I suppose it doesn't matter. Now that I think about it, if this all unfolds, will there be any shelter anywhere that would be adequate for the process of survival? The figure has moved to the center of the gathering. He stands there, unmoving just like the dot that has moved to the center of my forehead. Both are steady and unmoving. Both seem to be waiting, waiting for a movement, waiting for something, waiting for a signal. Some Nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. Listeners, hey, nothing is happening. 
except that my heart is beating so hard I can feel it about to explode out of my chest. The terror I feel is so intense, it seems to be a very palatable and physical force that is actually manifested in front of me as the sum of all my fears and nightmares. I cannot look away, I cannot move, I... still alive. The man in white raised a hand and everyone gathered came to attention. At the same moment the laser dot on my forehead winked out. I cannot hear what is being said but as I mentioned I am quite adept at reading lips. The man in white is uttering commands and everyone is obeying them without question. A number of men both from the men in black and the many gray factions are moving towards the man in white. Some appear to be resisting, others moving as if resigned to some known but unpleasant fate. I can only describe the looks on those resisting as that of sheer terror. Considering I just saw that look reflected in my own window only moments before, let me assure you, I know what it looks like. The man in white is glowering. I cannot see his eyes because the brim of his hat hides his features, but I can clearly see his lips. One of the men in gray steps forward and starts to speak. He speaks with confidence and a well-practiced smile. I cannot see what he says from here, but from his body language and gestures, he speaks as a man used to getting his way. But he never gets to finish. The man in white just said something in a language I do not know. But with but one word, the man in gray suddenly went rigid and collapsed. Yellow foam is forming on the corners of his mouth. He spasms, he now lies still. No one else dares to speak. They are like children, terrified that father has come home and found them committing forbidden acts. The man in white does nothing, he is Listeners, a new helicopter has arrived. It is sleek and gray. It has swooped down low over the station on its approach to the expanse. Also, I can see a black limo. It is also on approach. However, it is undeterred by the uneven ground as the two vehicles converge on the man in white. Both vehicles disgorge a single occupant spat out, as it were, unceremoniously deposited on the ground before the man in white. They stand up. One is a man in a black suit with a white pin on his tie. The other is a man in a gray suit with a single blue rose on his lapel. Others move forward and take the black bags from their heads. The two men both look like they were about to shout in indignation when light revealed to them the presence of the man in white. They grow pale before me and beneath the rolling and boiling sky. Whatever their protests were, they die rattling in their throats. The man in white steps up and removes the white pin and then this blue rose in a single smooth motion with a single hand. I can see his lips move with careful enunciation. I am disappointed. He turns and now I cannot see his lips. Two others, a man in gray and one in black, move forward to present themselves. The man in white places the pin on the man in black, then the flower on the man in gray then I believe he is saying some words of encouragement. I think one of them may be Agent Dacted? He turns back to the defrocked and says clearly, I left you in charge and you have failed in your duties. 
I cast you out. The one in black bows his head and starts to walk away. The other pulls out a gun. He places it in his mouth. He struggles. He is trying to pull the trigger. As he struggles, tears start to roll down his face. His eyes are begging. The man in white steps up and says, no. The one in gray drops the gun. He turns, he runs off into the wasteland. He is stripping off his clothes. He is tearing at his hair. He is screaming so loud I can almost hear him. His anguish is the only sound that can be heard over the energies in the sky. One of those gathered steps closer to the man in white. It's good to have you back, sir. He responds, back? No, I am not back. This is just an adjustment. I am putting you back on the path. Then he raises one hand, and with it, he makes a dismissive gesture, so slight, one would be hard pressed to believe it happened at all. Listeners, the storm has finally arrived in full force. The gales whip through my studio, the rain lashes at me, the lightning strikes, and listeners, I see why. From the ravine, it's unlight. There's no other word for it. It is unlight pouring from the earth. The world shakes and a massive hand rises up to grab at the edge of the cliff. A massive form slowly rises forth from the earth, or perhaps it is rising quickly, but because I cannot comprehend its full size and proportions, it merely seems slow. I now know who, or rather what, this is. It is Huntokar. He rises. His minions pour forth from the wounded earth. The men in gray and the men in black unite to fight back this assault. It is as if this was all preordained. Perhaps this still will be the beginning of the Blunt Space War. But the, from the east. The Angelicane has been joined by our school board president, the mighty Glow Cloud. A battle of gods is about to begin. Earth and air do battle, and we are caught between these titanic forces. I believe we are about to receive a final judgment, but we are all beneath notice in this unfolding conflict. Normally at this point I'd just take a coffee break and everything would work itself out, but in turn Phil has informed me that a simple coffee break would not be enough. With so many forces at work, I don't know if even Cecil going to the weather would be an that prophecy that intern Agni was babbling about. Yes, of course. If I could only get to Cecil's booth, but it's so far up above me. No, the window. The window's on the second floor. I could swing down to his booth. I just need my resignation letter. Perfect. All I need is one of Cecil's old weather reports and <sighs> listeners. Listeners, this is Robert York, your host. I am attempting to do the impossible. I have checked the capacitors and everything's on full. I am going to take a coffee break during a weather report. This has never been done before. I suspect I will not survive. I'm not even sure if the station will survive, but it is our only hope. However, if this is to be my end, there are just two things I want to say. 
first. Know that it has been an honor and privilege serving my community here at this radio station. I truly treasure my time here behind the mic, and I value every listener, all six of you. And second, I take my coffee black. And now, the weather. But I think it's time for a coffee break. And now, the weather. I'm going to take a coffee break. And now, the
must have zoned out there. My, my, look at the time. Oh, it seems like the evening got away from me. Oh, oh. I didn't realize things were getting so late. Well, another boring, uneventful night has come to a close. The first rays of a new day are starting to drive away the stars. Just a few holding out against the dying of the night. And yet, for some reason, I feel that this night might have been an important one. Has it been an important one for you, listener? You know, I feel like I have a bit of a hangover. I mean, it's not like there was this huge angelic cane that nobody was allowed to see and that everybody started drinking to forget and that the angels were curious as to what everybody was drinking and tried some and apparently angels can't hold their liquor so they all got blitzed and passed out. None of that could have possibly happened. You know, that brings to mind a story told to me by someone who I cannot remember under circumstances that I have completely forgotten. But I do remember what the man said. He said that there are men in this world who seek to accumulate. Wealth, power, control, it doesn't matter. Some do it out of greed, some for duty, but pity the man who does it for no reason at all. When the goal is the act itself, you are condemned to a living hell where you will never know peace or happiness. If such a man is lucky, fate will see fit to give him a connection. He will learn to think about the future, not for himself, but for those he loves. Such a man may come to hate what he once was, and seek to hide that man, bury him. Then he might become the man he wants to be. A simple man, a humble man, a man who gets what he always wanted, a family. Perhaps he devotes himself to helping others and his community. But such a man is not a fool. He knows his old life may come back to haunt him. Pity those who make him come out of retirement. They may discover just how much power he still commands. Or something like that, I forget. I'm just paraphrasing. As for the studio, we would have had a huge flooding problem if it weren't for the appearance of thousands of empty coffee mugs to catch all the water from the non-existent angelic cane. You know, I'm beginning to think these coffee mugs are some form of antibody that the station makes to protect itself. As we speak, ceiling squids are reaching down and taking the coffee mugs full of rainwater away to destinations unknown. So if the mugs are the antibodies and the squids are the lymphatic system that would make our program the spleen huh yep we are the spleen you really don't care about your spleen until it fills up with pus and bursts that describes this show perfectly as for night veil vale, everything has changed the damage is so extensive the very fourth wall has been shattered even as I speak, an image is forming in your head. That image is of a character. He is an albino in a white suit suit sitting behind a desk that is wedged into the handicap accessible stall of a disused bathroom in a forgotten steam tunnel under a radio station in an imaginary town called Night Vale. On one wall is a window that looks out the second floor of the station and you accept it without question. On the wall behind the character is a fire axe that is both black and white and a photographic negative. On the blade reads in felt tip marker the words, I quit. It is in a box labeled, in case of emergency, break glass. Outside the stall, interns Phil, Agnew, and Calhoun are all looking at each other quizzically, then to the severed monster head suspended in the air by a miniature zeppelin for guidance. The supervisor just mouths the words, Let's see where he goes with this. You see, the Angelicane didn't just disrupt Night Vale, but the very storyline itself. At the start of this episode, I said there was a dead body found outside the station that looked just like me. Truth is, it was me. I'm the tangent. I'm the Robert York that should not be. Robert York was supposed to die in an episode titled Marathon. So titled because it was he was going to die after jogging to work, much the same way that the first marathon runner died at the finish line. 
After that was supposed to be two more episodes. Atypical and literalism. Names chosen because if you take the first and second letter of all ten episodes and line them up, it spells paranormal and illuminati. Just a little joke. You see, people like their fiction to have a certain amount of internal consistency. We want our fiction to make sense or we hate it. It's because life doesn't make sense, and if we're going to experience a fiction, it had better well be better than the crap we have to deal with every day. Good fiction has rules. The rules are the problem. The rules demand my death. Those missing three episodes would have made it perfectly clear why and how I needed to die. That's the internal consistency of things. The problem is the point of this fiction was that life has no internal consistency. You see, Bob's job, among other things, is to talk people out of killing themselves. One thing he always hated was, the, was that rarely do people get the mental weapons they need to survive before they have a crisis. In the real world, they need to have a class in high school called Defensive Philosophy, which is the sole purpose of giving people the mental constructs they need to deal with life. For some reason, nobody wants to waste money on preventing a problem before it happens. This whole thing has been about sprinkling little tidbits that Bob used over the years to talk people back from the edge, or to put down the knife, or to tell them where they are so he can send the mobile CPEP squad. This episode is the big finale, but by the rules of fiction, they require my death. However, if we follow those rules, it's the exact opposite of the point that Bob was trying to make. So, instead of showing you, which is the rules, I'm just going to tell you. In the book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams said that the ultimate answer to life, the universe, and everything was 42. In the book, everybody flipped out that that was the answer because it made no sense to them, and they started looking for the ultimate question. The truth is, it doesn't matter what the answer to the question was, as long as there was an answer. If there is an answer, any answer, then life has ultimate and permanent meaning. We might not understand it, but it does mean something real and eternal, or there couldn't be one answer. If there was proof that the universe had some sort of permanent meaning, whatever it was. In Night Vale, there is an answer to life, the universe, and everything, but the answer is a bit different and easier to understand. The answer is someone is to blame, because all conspiracies in Night Vale are true. Someone is always at fault. There might not be any justice, but somewhere, no matter what happens, there is a face that deserves to be punched for every wrong that has ever happened. Wouldn't it be great to live in a world where there was always someone to blame? That is ultimately why Night Vale is so weird. The universe of Night Vale has to twist itself into a pretzel just to make sure that somewhere, someone, somehow is to blame for every little thing. But you live in the real world. A world that is ultimately built on chaos, where the only order created comes from living things, and the only meaning you will ever find is temporary. And that is a good thing. Because in the real world, there is justice or no point to it at all. Bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people, life isn't fair, but imagine how horrible the world would be if it was fair. A life that was fair would always require someone to blame. On top of that, you'd need to make sure they were justly punished. So not only would the universe have to twist itself into a pretzel, it means that if something bad happened to you, it'd be your own damn fault. If the world is absurd, then for all we know, the world is fair. That means that every crappy thing that ever happened to you happened because you had it coming. That is the foundation of a world that is fair. And if you try to tell me that a six-year-old girl who gets raped by her stepfather had it coming, I will find a way to slap you over the internet. I don't have a clue what real horror is. Bob works with it every day and he doesn't know what it is. It's infectious, he knows that much. It creates an imbalance, which has to explode outward or implode inward. And neither one of us has a damn clue which is worse. You aren't a bad person if something bad happens to you. Your life isn't being controlled and manipulated so that your life fits some ultimate answer or conforms to some universal law. It sucks, but you still have free will. You have choices, 
but they're horrible choices. But they're choices all the same. Life isn't fair, but you can't be free and have a world that is fair at the same time. Most importantly, in a world that is chaotic and without point or meaning, even when all options have been exhausted, even when the bottom drops out from under you, no matter what, there will always be hope. Even if you deserve a horrible ending, even if you have it coming, even if the storyline demands that you die, you never know when the universe will be completely unfair to everyone and everything allied against you, thus being completely unfair in your favor. Murphy's Law applies to everyone equally. And so, I will leave you with this thought. Do you want a world with hope, but the only justice being that which we make ourselves? Or a world with absolute justice, but everything wrong in your life is your own damn fault? I know Bob would prefer to live in a world with hope. And the knowledge that he didn't deserve a nut punch of such severity, it caused him to crap blood. And as always, Let's have a good morning, Night Vale. Good Morning Night Vale Tonight is a fan-created audio drama based on Welcome to Night Vale, as owned and produced by Night Vale Prudence from the guys over at www.commonplacebooks.com. Some music was from my computer, some from Google Freeplay. A bunch was from the free music archive, but also a special thanks to Morteth for allowing me free use of all of his cool tunes. The Coffee Weather was... The Angelicane, a remix created by me. Originally, I promised a 10-episode show. The first 10 episodes of Welcome to Night Vale were 3 hours and 44 minutes. I've clocked in at over 6 hours, and you have no idea how much I've cut out. Well, this wasn't where I was planning to wind up, but here we are. At this point, Robert York is going to continue happily broadcasting from obscurity, and this version of Night Vale is going to meander along on its own for a while. I might come back to revisit this someday, but I don't have any plans to do so. I only have so much available time, and as far as I'm concerned, Good Morning Night Vale tonight is going on hiatus. No promises, but who knows? In the meantime, look for a new audio drama called Heading Westward which is my next major project. Now I finally figured out exactly how I want it, especially since Morteth agreed to allow me the unlimited use of his awesome music. So go check him out on SoundCloud. He's the guy who wrote the weather in the Welcome to Night Vale bonus episode, What of the Sea? Trust me, this is going to be cool. And finally, the guy who wrote, edited, read, performed this poor deformed monstrosity of a script was me.